welcome once again to EWTN's Bookmark. I'm Doug Keck, your host. Today our guest author is R. Thomas Richard, author of The Interior Liturgy of the Owl Father, and it's published by Fidelis Publications. Welcome, Doctor, to Thank EWTN's Bookmark. Thank you very much. R. Thomas Richard. Uh, some people may remember you from another book about the, what was the Ordinary Path to Holiness, the ordinary right? Ordinary Path, yes. A few Thank years you. ago. Yes, and I was here uh, for that one, and, and I'm very grateful still. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. The interior liturgy of the Our Father. Now, you know, someone would look at this, and they, if they watch EWTN, we have Father Pablo Straub. He does uh -huh. take some prayers, the Our Father, the Hail Mary, kind of breaks them down in short little teaching segments, uh -huh. and and kind of gives you some underpinnings of our Lord's message. But this is the interior liturgy. We can talk about why you use the word liturgy, but this uh -huh. is much deeper, isn't it? Well, it is deep. It's as deep as prayer. It's as deep as relationship with Christ is. And um, fundamentally, liturgy is the work of Christ bringing us back into union with Him and the Father and the Holy Spirit. And we celebrate that work at the Holy Mass, that, that liturgy. It is, the, it, is, it is Christ's work. And um, in praying over the Our Father and trying to understand prayer myself, I came to realize that that work of Christ for our salvation, well, of course it has an interior component, and so it is rightfully called an interior work or an interior liturgy. But I came to see in the Our Father that the Our Father really does lead us through this liturgy, this interior work of Christ. And, and so the Lord gave us in the Our Father not merely a prayer. He gave us the whole journey, <laughs> the whole return to Him, His work within us. When did you become focused on the Our Father? When did this come to you when you were doing either your prayer or your work or mm -hmm. whatever, your ministry? Mm -hmm. I know you do something with your wife, Deborah, who you kind of included in the dedication yes, here, yes. Uh, kind of renewal ministry kind mm -hmm. of thing. Uh, when did this come to you? Well, when I was working on my first book, The Ordinary Path to Holiness, uh, there's a chapter in that book on the Our Father and the relationship between the seven petitions of the Our Father and the seven interior mansions that St. Teresa saw in the interior castle. Okay. I was really astounded when I saw this connection uh, and I started to pray over it and listen to it when I was working on that first book. Mm -hmm. But when I finished the first book, I, I resolved I needed to continue with this. And the more I prayed on it, reflected upon it, meditated upon it, studied it, uh, the more I, I wanted to write an entire book dedicated to this. Mm -hmm. I didn't understand it completely at the time, but I knew I had to set some time apart. So how long did it take you to put this together? Well, I took a year off, <laughs> and uh, fortunately my wife kept working, <laughs> supported us, <laughs> and I, uh, I focused on this uh, second book for that year, and most of it was completed within that year. Mm -hmm. Although in the next, uh, in the following two or three years, I, I went back and made some changes and refinements and that sort of thing. Now, in your dedication, you say we pray that it might be used toward the renewal of His Holy Church. Yes. What kind of renewal do you see the need for, and how do you see this fitting in? I'm so grateful to the Holy Father because He has pointed us to renewal so consistently throughout His pontificate. Uh, he has. He has urged us to be courageous, to be faithful, to be true, to trust Christ, and to come into that interior union with Christ. That is prayer. Uh, St. John Vianney says prayer is nothing other than union with God. Uh, that is so very, very beautiful. And in our catechism, in the four parts of the catechism, we show clearly the four pillars of our faith, the four pillars of the faith. And so we have the creed, the, the content of our faith, we have the sacramental life, the moral life, and prayer. And, and I found, find that we have, uh, we, we have many people working on those first three parts. <laughs> we have many excellent apologists in the church who are defending the faith. Many especially now waking up to the dangers of, of, of lives contrary to the moral life that we're called to in, in Christ. Uh, there are many Catholics, perhaps, who have a, a sacramental life that, that doesn't reach that interior union that it could. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the more I thought about this, the more I realized that that fourth component, prayer, is crucial for tying all four pillars together in Christ. That without that depth of union that we find in prayer, 
the other components of the faith can be superficial. Mm-hmm. And, and so we need to, to grow in prayer. And that's why I guess that there's such an emphasis in the priesthood on the, on the, on the daily office that, that, oh, yes. that one can get caught up in the doing and not in the being, as yes. it's said sometimes. Yes, yes. When I, t- I talked with a president rector of a, of a seminary, and in fact, I did some presentations for his seminarians, and he told me that although they require of their seminarians, they have to spend so many hours before the Blessed Sacrament. He said, in talking with the seminarians, he discovered they don't know what to do. That many of them go into the chapel. When they're actually there. When they're actually there. That okay. they need guidance. Uh, to How do you pray? How do you enter this life of prayer? How do you begin a, a habit of prayer? And so I think that this is a need really throughout the church, that we need to learn how to pray. And Jesus, in response to the question, he said, when you pray, pray like this, our Father. Who are, uh, and it's not just a formula. It's much, much more. Right, and it's not just a rote prayer, obviously. Exactly. And I guess to some yeah. degree, uh, mm-hmm. some uh, formulaic prayer kind of got into disuse and got a bad reputation there well, for did. a while. It did. And it's easy to misuse any formula prayer because we can just recite it. We, we can just mechanically recite it, just like a tape recorder, without entering into its interiority, its, its depth. Mm-hmm. And so we have to slow down, and, and we, have to, we have to approach these beautiful prayers, and especially the Our Father, because this came to us directly from Jesus, directly from God himself. So we have to slow down, we have to listen to this prayer, and we have to enter it as persons. Uh, with full conscious active participation uh, uh, to which we're called in all liturgies, but especially this one. Well, you say in the prologue this book is concerned primarily with prayer and uh, obviously the Our mm-hmm. Father, and the book is intended not to be merely talking about prayer, but a personal and helpful guide to the spiritual life. Is that a problem you see sometimes with books? Well, that they we can talk be, about it, but yeah, don't experience it? We, we can become too academic, too intellectually oriented, toward things in theology it is certainly theology requires our intellectual engagement but it has to also touch the heart it has to it has to gather us as human persons into its truth and so this is this is my hope that this book will hope will helpfully uh, hopefully help <laughs> Uh, guide us through this journey as living persons. Well, the structure of the book, and you mentioned it in the prologue, you say the book is in two parts. Part one is the introduction to the prayer. But then you say, but please do not pass over this introduction to get more quickly to part two, the prayer itself, because the introduction is actually four chapters. It's a long section. Most people think of an introduction as being like one short you know, section, and then you get into it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and what are you afraid? Afraid that people just kind of, everybody wants to get to the meat? Well, and that's what I would do. I, okay. I think if I were to pick up a book and say, well, introduction, all right, I jump right. Okay. Of course, my wife always, she starts with a preface right. and then the introduction. Right. But uh, I think it's well, You're important. more digital thinker, right? That's I guess. You're randomly accessing Yes, I just jump. I want to jump here That's and what there. I say. <laughs> but, but to really approach this prayer as it deserves, as it requires, if we would enter it, we must enter it prayerfully, really as though we were walking on holy ground, taking off our shoes, so to speak. And so to, to slow down and to learn how we approach this prayer, it has many dimensions. There are many levels uh, on which this prayer works in us. Mm-hmm. And so in the introduction, I, I try to help people uh, slow down and get ready for all that is in this prayer because there is much, much more than I think most of us realize. Well, you say the perspective presented here is somewhat unusual how so well because it it views the prayer as the entire journey of prayer itself that it is it's not simply a formula that 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 we should recite most definitely not that but it's more than simply a guide to prayer uh, because it does show us a path it does show us the way that Christ works in us he works in us according to stations a word that I, I, I use, stations that are characterized by each of the seven petitions of this prayer. Mm-hmm. And so it, it, more is required than simply meditating on the petitions. Now that in itself is a wonderful work, a wonderful way to begin the prayer, simply meditate on the petitions. But more than that, the petitions have a certain sequence and one leads into the other in a particular way and when we realize that, when we understand the correlation between this prayer 
and traditional Catholic spirituality of the three stages of the interior life and also the seven uh, mansions of Teresa's interior castle. Okay. When we see that correlation, then we can approach this prayer as truly a guide to the interior life. Now you use, uh, like you said, you use the word liturgy in a slightly different way than most of us would mm-hmm. think about it. You also talk about things, and you have a chart later in the book that kind of lays it all out. Mm-hmm. You talk about the first movement, and you talk about the first station. You know, yes. movement sounds like music. Yeah. Where do these terms come from? Well, I was searching for words to use to characterize the structure of the prayer. I began to see that the the traditional three stages of the interior life, that is the stage of the beginner or the purgative stage, the illuminative stage or stage of the proficient, and the third stage, the unitive stage or the stage of the perfect that has been recognized in the church for a very long time, many centuries, as the three major stages of the interior life, that these stages have a correlation in our liturgy of the Mass, in the communal liturgy of the Mass. That is, the liturgy of the Word corresponds in a certain way to the stage of the beginner in the spiritual journey. And the consecration at the altar corresponds in a certain way to the illuminative stage. And I don't know if we have time to really go into this, but, but Christ appears differently to a person in the stage of the beginner and in the illuminative stage. Christ becomes much more real experientially uh, a person enters mystical prayer uh, leaving ascetical prayer when he enters into the the illuminative stage of the spiritual life and in the celebration of the mass in the communal liturgy of the mass when the priest moves from the liturgy of the word to the altar to begin the consecration and then the communion the holy communion Christ is among us in a radically different way, Mm -hmm. (laughs) as we know in in the church. Jesus Christ is present substantially, body, blood, soul, and divinity. He was present in his word. He was present in the congregation. He was present in the priest. But now at the consecration at the altar, he becomes present substantially. And there is a corresponding difference when a person in, 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 in his own relationship with Christ enters the illuminative stage Christ is present differently. It's, the difference is what the apostles experienced when Christ came to them in the upper room mm-hmm. after the resurrection. Mm-hmm. They knew Christ in a way totally different, radically differently from the way they had known Jesus before. Okay. And so the third stage beyond that, after the ascension of Christ, and they gathered in the upper room and the Holy Spirit came to them on Pentecost, they knew God Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in a radically new way. There's a corresponding way in which we come to know God differently in the celebration of the Holy Mass when we receive it in communion. That is, in in the Mass, we have these three stages, the, the, the liturgy of the Word, the consecration at the altar, and finally the Holy Communion, these three stages. Well, these three stages are present in God's interior work in us also, this interior liturgy. You see, so I'm thinking, I was, I was asking how, Lord, how, what word can I use to describe this? Right. It is a movement of Christ's work. Right. And, and so I say, okay, we could call these three times or these three experiences or these three works uh, three movements. of Right, the which you have is the interior liturgy of the word, the consecration at the altar of the heart and communion with Christ. That's the yes, way you kind of lined yes, up yes. with in, the, in the, interior the, three, liturgy. the three stages. Uh-huh. And on page 216 in the book, you kind of lay out a chart, which yes. uh, I found helpful in kind of uh-huh. following, uh, you know, with the movements in the interior liturgy, yes. stations of the interior liturgy, and the yes. petitions of the Our Father itself to kind of how you lined everything up and how yes. one relates to the other. Yes. In Chapter 3, you, you mentioned about uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, mm-hmm. uh, who, s- who saw that the seven petitions contained, in some way, this is from the Our Father, mm-hmm. uh, all the legitimate desires we have, and that the sequence of the petitions as Jesus gave them to us is highly significant. Mm-hmm. And that he gave us the order in which we ought to desire these gifts for our affections to be properly related and directed. Yes, yes. 
That, that w for me, was the key to understanding the sequence of the petitions, and, and really it all began to unfold after that, thanks to St. Thomas Aquinas. The last sentence in that quote uh, on, on page 37 of the book where St. Thomas wrote, and this is in the Summa, Thus it is evident that the first thing to be the object of our desire in the prayer, in the petitions of the prayer, the first thing to be the object of our desire is the end, not the last but thing, but, but the, the intention, the goal. The first is the goal, and then after, whatever is directed toward that goal. And so the very first petition of the Our Father, hallowed be thy name, that should have the primacy of our desire and affection, that God intends that the holiness of his name be the final end in this list of petitions, the, the final goal. What comes after that then is ordered toward, uh, it is directed to that end. Mm -hmm. and, and so the first petition, hallowed be thy name, is, is the highest goal. But the petition after that, thy kingdom come, directs us to the holiness of the name. Well, the holiness of his name then is, is our first desire. Thy kingdom come is next in order of affection. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven then becomes that which directs us to the intermediate goal, which is thy kingdom come. Mm -hmm. What would you say to somebody who'd say, you know, I say the Our Father, you know, every day probably, uh, pretty close mm -hmm. to it, I certainly say it, uh, you know, weekly. Um, and, you know, I, I certainly get the general idea about, you know, our Lord and calling him our Father. But, you know, if I have to spend all my time thinking about all these insights in there, you know, how does that really affect me in my everyday life? Well, the first, the first stage, I think, in approaching the prayer is to slow down and listen, to meditate upon each of the petitions. That's, that's the first step, to approach this prayer as a vocal prayer, as a formula vocal prayer that needs to be listened to very, very uh, attentively. Uh, St. Teresa taught that attention and devotion are the prerequisites to vocal prayer. But then after that, if we, if we are faithful in vocal prayer, the heart will begin to hunger for true meditation upon the truth of God. And as we begin to meditate, to seriously and faithfully meditate upon these petitions, we will begin to see relationships. What, what I've tried to do in this book is, is to maybe explicitly point out how each petition leads into the next petition in this interior work of Christ. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it, I, I believe that the book can help us to enter more deeply into the prayer. Well, it's really like an onion, like they always talk about, which uh, you yes. keep peeling away and peeling away, and there's really one layer, and then there's another layer, and another yes, layer. And yes. sometimes what, what's interesting, and I think you show in the book, is that you can take even the same petition and have multiple layers oh, to yes. that one petition. Yes, right? yes. Uh, a dear friend, of, a priest friend of mine said that the prayer is like that. It's like peeling back the layers of an onion and you, you patiently peel back and maybe cry a little. Mm -hmm. And that's what onions do for us. Right, that's a good point because I know you, you do make the point here. You say that, you know, in, in a sense, prayer requires suffering. It does. The, the journey requires suffering. Jesus was explicit with his disciples. It took them a while to understand this, as it takes us a while to understand it. That he, Jesus wasn't just using words when he said, you must take up your cross and follow me. Because we're invited to enter into his redemptive suffering. And, and so the life of prayer is intimately connected with the life of suffering. The other thing that was interesting was here we are, we're focused on the Our Father, and you talk about in this book the importance of our relationship with Mary in yes. spiritual life. The relations, our relationship with Mary, I believe, grows organically with, right alongside our relationship with Jesus. That um, if a person has a truly personal, authentic, profound relationship with Christ, his relationship will, with Mary will be that way. A superficial relationship with Christ will lead to a superficial relationship with Mary. And I discover in the interior life, as, as we grow in prayer, as we approach Jesus, we begin to see Mary there. Mary is always there, very, very close to Jesus. And just as from the cross, Jesus gave the beloved disciple to 
his mother Mary and gave Mary to the beloved disciples, so too in our prayer, when we reach that place of prayer there at the cross with Jesus, with the beloved disciple, we too receive Mary in a radically different way, a deeper way, a way in which we can see in a, in a contemplative way, in a, in, a, in a spiritual way, we can see the place of Mary, the, the purpose of Mary, so to speak, in God's redemption. Why the Immaculate Conception is so important to us. Mm-hmm. In Chapter 4, uh, Characteristics uh, of the Our Father, there's a section of the Prayer of Liturgy and Sacrament. I thought it was interesting mm-hmm. that you kind of relate, in, like the individual petitions, like yes. deliver us from evil. Here, the sacramental grace of baptism is called forth in the yes. work of Christ. Yes. Lead us not into temptation. Here, the sacramental grace of confirmation is called forth. And, and you kind of go through the various... Uh, uh, parts give us this day our daily bread of course uh, you know someone would see the Holy Eucharist in that mm-hmm. thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven here is uh, the sacramental grace of anointing is called forth and you say finally the graces of the sacraments of communion the crowning work of perfection are prayed for in the last two sections thy kingdom come here the sacramental grace of orders is called forth in the work of Christ so that would be the priesthood there related yes. to the priesthood. Mm-hmm. And hallowed be thy name. This I was I thought was interesting. Here the sacramental grace of marriage is called, called for. Where did yes. hallowed be the, how does that connect to marriage? <laughs> uh, by the way, that's another reason that, that I call this a liturgy, an interior liturgy, because the fullness of the liturgy of the church, all seven sacraments, do fit into this prayer alongside this prayer very beautifully, very naturally, or supernaturally. The holiness of the name, um, St. Teresa in the interior uh, castle wrote that the final stage of prayer for a human person before the beatific vision uh, she called the conforming union and she likened it to the marriage, the spiritual marriage of the soul with his majesty. And, And I find it remarkable that this is the case also in the interior liturgy, this other way of looking at the, the interior journey. That just as the woman takes upon herself the name of her husband, so it is also a Christian in the interior liturgy when he reaches this depth of prayer, this, this fullness of authentic communion in Christ, enters the holiness of the name of God, the mysterious name of God. And th- that's a meditation in itself. We could meditate upon the name of God the rest of our lives, I suppose. The, the Catechism says that this petition, hallowed be thy name, encloses all of the other in the prayer. The, the, all seven petitions are in this one petition, hallowed be thy name, because the name of God communicates God. And because that's who it's all directed to. Yes, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God. The, the, the Father has the name, the Son has the name received from the Father, and the Holy Spirit has this one name. Mm -hmm. And we are invited into this name in a spiritual union so beautiful and deep that it could be called a spiritual marriage Mm -hmm. uh, in this seventh uh, station. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, obviously I think if if one looks, like I said, at page 216, which relates to three stages, and the petitions are are, are right there related to what you're talking about in Mm -hmm. in the book... uh, just before we go, obviously, the Our Father is supremely and sacramental liturgical prayer. It is the prayer of the entire saving work of Christ in the soul. Yes. And you've come to see that more since doing this book, I'm assuming. Right? I, yes, I have. I have. I'm already working on the second edition. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> in my mind, because uh, it's infinitely deep, uh, as mm-hmm. prayer deserves to be. Okay. And so, uh, well, just before we go, uh, besides working on the next edition, what else are you working on? Well, my wife and I are working on a book together, by okay. the way, uh, in which we're exploring the masculine and, and, and feminine perspectives of discipleship. Uh, and that's, that's a very beautiful um, effort and experience for us. Uh, my wife and I share a ministry uh, pointed toward renewal in the church. And uh, we have a website, uh, uh, www.renewthechurch.com. And, and we try to make some resources available there for people seeking renewal, especially resources for prayer, because I believe that prayer uh, holds it together. And we need to grow in prayer. Right. Yeah. 
Well, hopefully with this book, we can certainly grow in prayer related to the Our Father. Thank you very much for being our guest here on Bookmark. Our author has been R. Thomas Richard, Dr. R. Thomas Richard, the author of The Interior Liturgy of the Our Father, published by Fidelis Publications, available through the EWTN Religious Catalog. Check it out. Check us out next time right here on EWTN's Bookmark. The book featured on this episode of EWTN Bookmark is available from EWTN Religious Catalog. For more information, call EWTN Religious Catalog toll-free at 1-800-854-6316. That's 1-800-854-6316. Or log on to our website at www.ewtnreligiouscatalog.com.